Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to continue our series of deep dives by looking at a process that you likely do hundreds of times a day without even really thinking about it, requesting a web page from a remote server. How does it all work? Well, we're going to examine the process all the way from the URL to your GPU and demystify the entire thing. When we're done, I'm sure you'll be blown away by how much work is really going on behind the scenes. And better yet, you'll have a very crisp understanding of how a web request is satisfied on the modern internet. So let's get right to it. Our journey of a thousand miles begins like any other with a single step. And that step is when the user enters a URL into the browser or clicks on a link. Let's assume it's something simple like google.com and we'll start there. Step one, the user enters the URL in the browser. When the user types a URL into the browser's address bar, the browser quickly parses that URL, determining if it's a web address, a search query, or a local file. For a web address, the browser confirms the protocol, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, and prepares to resolve the domain name into a usable IP address. Now, this step is foundational, telling the browser where to send the request on the vast landscape of the internet. To get the IP address, we must move on to step two, domain name resolution, DNS. To find the actual server where the page lives, the browser needs to know its IP address, so it performs a DNS lookup. DNS stands for Domain Naming System, and it's like the phone book for the entire internet. Which I suppose may not help you if you don't remember what the phone book is, but nonetheless, it's a way of transforming the name of the website into a digital IP address. First, the system checks its local cache to see if it's already resolved this address recently. And if not, it then reaches out to the DNS server appointed to your system. Your DNS server was likely assigned to you when your machine got a dynamic IP address from its own DHCP server. It can also be manually specified in the settings for your network adapter. The DNS server is often managed by your ISP or a dedicated DNS provider like Google or Cloudflare. The DNS server returns the IP address associated with the domain name you gave it, guiding the browser to the server's precise location on the internet. If you wanted to override the IP address for a remote site or to add a name for a local IP address that doesn't have a DNS name, you could add it to a system file known as the hosts file. Any entries there take precedence over the formal DNS lookup. Either way, at this point, the client has an IP address, so it can begin to initiate communications and we can move on to step three, establishing the connection. With the IP address in hand, the browser can now establish a connection to the web server. This connection typically uses the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which is a reliable connection-oriented protocol. Unlike User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, which is a connectionless protocol where data packets are sent without verification or receipt, TCP prioritizes the reliable delivery of data, ensuring that all the packets are arrived intact and in the correct order. This is crucial for loading web pages, as a missing or out-of-order packet in an HTML document could result in an incomplete or, at best, corrupted document. So to initiate the connection, TCP performs a process known as a three-way handshake. First, the browser, acting as the client, sends a SYN packet, or S-Y-N packet, to the server to request a connection. The SYN packet includes a unique, randomly generated sequence number, which will help both sides keep track of each packet during the session. When the server receives this request, it replies with a SYN ACK packet, which acknowledges the client's request and contains a new sequence number generated by the server. Finally, the client responds with an ACK packet, acknowledging the server's sequence number. At this point, the TCP connection is officially established and data can begin to flow in both directions. If the requested site is using HTTPS, an additional layer of security is added to this process with an SSL slash TLS handshake. Immediately after the TCP connection is established, the browser and server start an SSL TLS handshake to create an encrypted communication channel. This handshake process involves exchanging encryption algorithms, agreeing on a secret shared key, and authenticating the server's identity with a digital certificate. Through this handshake, both client and server agree on a shared encryption key that will secure all data exchanged over the session, ensuring privacy and integrity especially important for sensitive data like passwords or your payment details. Once the SSL TLS handshake is complete, the browser and server have a secure encrypted connection over which they can begin to exchange HTTP requests and responses. This careful setup process is crucial to the web experience, maintaining both the reliability and security of the data flowing between the client and the server. 
Now that the connection is established and secure, the browser can proceed with sending the HTTP request to retrieve the web content. It's important to remember that the secure SSL channel is created before the web request, including the URL is even sent. So while your ISP can tell what IP addresses you're visiting, it has no idea what specific URLs or sites you're visiting on secure sites as that information is encrypted. But now it's time to move on to step four, sending the HTTP request. Now that a connection is in place, the browser is ready to request the content of the web page. It does this by sending an HTTP GET request to the server, asking specifically for the HTML of the page associated with the URL that the user entered. This request is more than just a simple message. It includes a collection of headers containing essential information for the server. These headers act like metadata about the request and the client, helping the server to understand and how to process and respond to it. One of the most important headers is known as the user agent, which identifies the browser making the request. This detail allows the server to tailor its response based on the client's capabilities, such as the rendering capability settings. Other headers might include cookies, which are small pieces of data that the server previously stored on the client's browser. Cookies allow the server to recognize returning users, manage sessions, or even store preferences, enhancing the continuity and personalization of the web experience. Additionally, there are caching-related headers that allow the browser to specify whether it already has some resources locally and only needs the latest updates if they've changed, which can reduce load times. The browser sends this GET request through the TCP connection that it previously established. The request then begins its journey across the internet, traversing multiple networks and routers that forward it on to its ultimate destination. At each hop, the request packet is rerouted and handled by network devices, ultimately arriving at the target server, where it lands in the web server's queue. This entire process, which just takes milliseconds, is vital to delivering a seamless browsing experience, setting the stage for the server to retrieve and send back the requested web page content. And that brings us to step five, the server receives the request. Once the request arrives at the server, it's routed to the appropriate web service. The server software, such as Apache or Nginx, directs the request, possibly involving the backend systems if the page is dynamically generated. Here, the server might consult databases or call APIs or execute server-side scripts to compile a customized response like a user's dashboard, product list, or recent activity. Step six, backend processing, which is optional. If the requested page requires personalized or dynamic content, like the dashboard we mentioned, or a profile page, or a search results page, the server needs to do more than just serve up a static file. In these cases, it enters the backend processing stage where it pulls data from various sources to build a customized response. This often involves querying a database to retrieve user-specific information, such as recent activities, preferences, or saved settings. The server may also execute application logic, applying business rules or calculations to determine what content should actually appear. Additionally, it might call other internal or external services like payment processes or recommendation engines or advertising services to enrich the page with relevant data. This backend processing is what enables a server to deliver a page tailored to each user's needs rather than generating a static page. The steps involved can be complex, especially when pulling data from multiple sources or handling large volumes of information, but they're essential to creating the rich interactive web experience that we expect these days. Once this processing is complete, the server compiles the response, ready to send it back to the client. Step seven, generating the response. At this point, the server, having processed the request, prepares an HTTP response. This response contains a status code, such as 200 for success, or 404 for not found, or another number if something else went wrong. And it also adds any additional headers that might be required, such as the content type, to specify what data format you're using or caching instructions. The response body includes the HTML of the requested page, plus any inline CSS or JavaScript needed to structure and style it. At its most basic, this response will look pretty much exactly the same as an HTML file loaded up into your notepad editor might. Step 8. Sending the HTTP response. Traveling through routers, the response makes its way back to the user's machine, where the browser receives it and can now start to process the page contents. This is where the magic of the rendering begins. Step nine, receiving the response. As the browser receives the response data from the server, it begins the initial steps of loading the web page. The response typically contains the main HTML document along with headers that provide important metadata. 
These headers inform the browser about the type of content being used, the encoding, the caching directives, as well as any cookies or security policies, and other things that can affect how the content is going to be displayed or loaded. Once the browser verifies the content type is HTML, it prepares to process that document. The data arrives in packets, so the browser may start handling it even before the entire response has been received, enabling a faster, more progressive rendering. This means that while more data is still coming in, the browser can start understanding the structure of the page and even prepare to render it. The browser's rendering engine then starts reading through the HTML, identifying the document structure as it moves along. This involves initial tasks, such as distinguishing between different tags and their attributes, which will eventually influence how the page is displayed. Now, with the initial HTML document in hand and the resources lined up for retrieval, the browser is ready to start the detailed process of parsing the HTML to build out the web page structure in the upcoming steps. Step 10. HTML parsing and resource requests. At this point, the browser's rendering engine takes over, immediately starting to parse the HTML document line by line. This process involves building a DOM, or document object model, a tree-like structure in memory where each HTML element becomes a node in the tree. The DOM serves as a live representation of the document structure, helping the browser keep track of every element and its hierarchical relationship to the other elements on the page. As the HTML is parsed, the browser encounters references to external resource files like CSS files, JavaScript files, images, and so on. Each of these resources will be essential for styling, interactivity, or visual content, so the browser again issues additional HTTP requests to retrieve them. These requests often happen concurrently, in parallel, taking advantage of multiple connections to reduce loading time. Meanwhile, as the CSS files begin to arrive, the browser builds a CSS object model, another tree structure representing the visual styling rules for each element in the DOM. And with both the DOM and the CSS object model trees in place, the browser moves on to layout calculation, determining the exact position and size of each element based on the styling rules and the structure of the page. Finally, it reaches the painting phase where each element is drawn as pixels on the screen. But this process isn't just a simple display function. It's a coordinated, iterative effort to interpret and apply all the rules while maintaining responsiveness. This progressive loading is what allows users to see content appear bit by bit, even as some resources are still downloading, giving the impression of a faster load time. Throughout this process, the rendering engine works closely with the JavaScript engine if any scripts are embedded in the HTML or get loaded from external files. JavaScript can modify the DOM or CSS object model in real time, allowing for dynamic content updates and interactive content. As these changes occur, the rendering engine recalculates the layout and repaints the necessary parts of the screen. This sophisticated layered approach ensures that the final web page is visually accurate and interactive, transforming the raw HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into the polished visual that the users expect. Step 11, the rendering engine. With the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files in hand, the browser's rendering engine takes on the job of turning code into the final visual layout. It begins by combining the DOM, which represents the document structure from the HTML, and the CSS object model, which holds all the styling rules from the CSS. Together, these models form the render tree, which contains only the visible elements on the page with applied styling and layout properties. This tree excludes non-visible elements like head tags, focusing solely on content meant for display. Next, the rendering engine enters the layout calculation stage, determining the precise location, dimensions, and stacking order of every element in the render tree. This involves calculating sizes based on CSS rules, accounting for responsive design, flex blocks, grids, and other tables and layout properties. For example, if elements are set to adjust based on screen size, the rendering engine calculates these adjustments in real time. This layout process can be complex, especially on pages with intricate styling or elements that adapt dynamically. Once the layout is set, the rendering engine moves to the paint phase, where it translates the layout into the actual pixels on the screen. Each visual element, text, image, borders, shadows, and backgrounds, is painted according to its position and styling properties. Here, the rendering engine converts the structure into layers and issues detailed drawing instructions to the GPU. It optimizes rendering speed and offloads intensive graphics tasks from the CPU. For modern browsers, this process includes a technique called layer compositing. Elements that have complex effects, like animations, 3D transformations, or opacity changes are separated into individual layers. 
The GPU can then manage these layers independently, updating only the portions of the screen that change, which boosts performance and responsiveness, especially for animations. Step 12, GPU processing and display. Finally, the GPU processes these instructions, updating its frame buffer with the final image that's going to be displayed. In just a few moments after typing the URL, an intricate system of web processes works together seamlessly to bring a web page to life. From parsing the URL and resolving the domain name to setting up a secure connection, sending requests, and finally rendering the content on your screen, each step is crucial to delivering a smooth and responsive web experience. This journey spans multiple layers of software, hardware, protocols, and network infrastructure, all coordinated to present a familiar interface with remarkable speed and reliability. When you view a website, you're not just seeing static content, but interacting with a sophisticated dance of protocols, engines, and servers. Every image, piece of text, and interactive feature represents the hard work of systems working invisibly in the background to bring the internet to your fingertips. Truly understanding this process reveals the depth of what might appear to be a simple action, and it highlights the power and elegance of modern computing. The next time you enter a URL, you'll know just how much magic and engineering is happening beneath the surface. If you found today's trip across the internet and back to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Consider turning on the notification bell and perhaps sharing this episode with somebody you think might be interested in it. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.